Amen. I have the privilege of reading God's Word to you today. It's out of Job 38, and uh, it's an interesting time in Job. Uh, Job was questioning a lot of things, and he was getting unwise counsel. And uh, God put a man named Elihu in his life to speak truth into it and to chastise him. And then God steps up and tells him the truth. So here we go. Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where, you, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have an understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further. And here shall you your proud ways be stayed. Here ends the word. All right. Well, like Jared mentioned, Pastor Brian is, is on vacation today, and he did a great job of leaving the topic of science to me, which you can tell I'm a scientist, and so that in itself is a good start. Uh, but like I s mentioned earlier, my name is Matt. I'm the director of discipleship here, and it's a, it's a joy to be with you this morning. This series that, that we've started, Jesus Among Secular Gods, it really focuses on worldviews and, and different ways of understanding the world and, and viewing the world and acting in the world. And the verse that we've used through this is 1 Peter 3.15, and so if you would read this with me. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And as we, we've said through this series, we will do some question and answer uh, towards the end, and you can text that in, um, you can tweet it. Um, if you Instagram it, it's up there. I don't know that it'll get seen there today. Uh, we might not have as, as te technical of a group on the backside there. So stick. Oh, Keys has got it. Keys is in. So uh, you can do that. All right. So text in questions as we go through this. And uh, we'll, we'll do our best to answer some of those as we, as we finish uh, today. And so... The reason that we have this series is simply this. It's because everybody lives somewhere forever. Everybody lives somewhere forever. And live like Jesus. And we believe that we're called to make disciples here and to teach the truth. And so it's, it's part of who we are, and it's important that we understand not just what we believe, but what others believe as well. Uh, on science, just out of curiosity, does anyone here get science? Anyone here think scientifically? Like, yeah? That's excellent. Uh, here's where this message is, will be somewhat challenging to you at at mo or the most challenging part will be is that we're actually we're going to encourage you to think beyond function so to answer questions that don't necessarily just pertain to how do things work and all of our non-science people if you're here um for for you what this is this what this message has for you is that just because you don't understand how everything works, it doesn't mean you can't have an intelligent and meaningful conversation. You absolutely can. And so we're going to get into those things today. And one more disclaimer before we get started here is that there are amazing scientists that are doing incredible research. 
They are researching things that are meaningful and that matter and that will change lives. And they'll have a great impact on our world. And we honor that and we think that is awesome. Uh, we think that is a great gift that God has given us. Uh, but we, today we're going to stick to our main point. And the main point is that everybody lives somewhere forever. And we want to be part of what God is doing in our world. We want to be part of what God is doing in our world. And if we can come alongside with God and be part of that plan, that's, that's what we're called to do. And so, what is scientism? All right, scientism is this. It's the belief that science can explain everything rather than a lot, and that it's disproved the need for and the existence of God. It's a belief that science can explain everything rather than explain a lot, and that it disproves the need for and the existence of God. And this is not really something new. You know, this is uh, something that's been going on for a while throughout humanity. And if you look at the root of this, it's actually rooted in, in atheism. Um, and you'll notice throughout this series, a lot of the worldviews we talk about have, have some roots in atheism. And atheism has this. It, it's kind of the assumption of, it's an assumption that's rooted in atheism, and it, which has the root desire to be accountable to no one. And I don't know about you, but when I read that definition, there's times where just in my own sinfulness, and my own brokenness, I can be like, ew, I, I kind of like to be accountable to no one at times. Um, and so, and that's okay. You know, there's, there's tensions we wrestle with here. But this is where atheism is rooted. The root desire is to be accountable to nobody. And we see this in Genesis chapter 3, all the way back. That the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. It's a temptation as old as time. That you'll be like God. So why does this matter? Why should scientism matter to us? Well, I'll give you a few reasons. One is that it's, it's taught in our schools pretty exclusively. Um, it's, it surrounds us in the academic and in our university s- settings. And that's not necessarily all bad that science is taught. In no way is this a science is bad talk, but it should be conflicting with us when we see statistics that, like this, that wh- what do scientists believe about God? Well, according to a Pew poll in 2009, 40% believe in God, 50% don't, 10% don't know. Uh, that there's just this split, even within the scientific community, of, of what is there beyond science. Uh, and then you see below, over 75% of Americans think scientific evidence for and against evolution should be taught. And so there's, uh, it, there's, there's great value, not just to, uh, in our society for truth, but for it to be even cited. When there's evidence for something, it should be presented. When there's evidence against it, it should be presented. It matters to us as Christians. Look at this, Psalm 19. It says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And if you read to the next verse, it actually says, like, he speaks, but there is no sound, but it is heard. <laughs> I mean, it gets, it is, it's incredible. So sci- even in Scripture, how things work matters to us. Science matters. And at the end of the day, in our society, science gives us a lot of understanding of how our world works. And, and we place value on that, and that's important. And so when we start looking at scientism, it becomes really important when we start looking at a great tool that's taken to be a belief that's the end-all, be-all. And that can explain everything, and you don't need anything beyond it. So what does this actually lead to? All right, mostly it leads to a lot of memes. And you get things like this, right? You know, the with atheism and, you know, the belief that nothing and nothing happened to nothing and so on. And, and this goes both ways. This isn't just for, for atheism. You know, we get the same for, for Christianity as well. 
You know, snark has no bias here. It is, it is universally shared. And, and so, it, but what does it lead to? It leads to a lot of things. And we're going to get into those beyond memes. And the question that was asked last week was, can you reconcile Christi- being a Christian with believing in evolution? And so let's just do that as succinctly as possible, even though this can be like, I think you can, pro- you can probably get degrees in this. Um, I'm sure somewhere is offering them. And there's much discussion to this. But can you be a Christian and can you believe in evolution? A few things with this. There is... There's a difference here in, in macroevolution and microevolution and adaptation. There's very few people who will say that there is no such thing as adaptation, but they're maybe not as sold on saying, hey, this, this whole um, evolving from nothing, I'm not as sold on that. Uh, and so there's that part to it. There's uh, evolution, it's challenged by the second law of thermodynamics. I'm very careful at saying the word challenged and not misproven or proven. Uh, because it gets into the second law there gets into biogenesis and things like life comes from life and entropy that that everything decays Uh, and the second law it also kind of implies that the universe it began in a highly organized state you know which leads to the question well where did that come from how did that get there but I mean we if you're really going to go down this path of debate we you have to also remember, this also stems from two sides that have very different presuppositions. And there's probably not going to be a lot of agreement that comes at the end of that with those presuppositions if you go down this path. Because remember, what's the big point? The main point is everybody lives forever somewhere. Everybody lives forever somewhere. We're not called to win every argument. We're called to make disciples. And so I would, I would caution you, if you want to go down this road, uh, it, it, it's a road, um, and it'll lead to things, but it might not lead to the main point. So can you be a Christian and believe in evolution? Sure, you can. Now what, what does happen here at times, if you go so far as to say, well, I'm not sure if the creation story in Genesis is accurate. You start hitting a slippery slope when you start doing that because when you, one, of the, one of the core beliefs we have is that we uphold scripture above us and we say that, that God's word is greater than us. God's word speaks to us. It has authority over us. And then we can start picking and choosing and saying, you know what, I like this and I agree with this, but I don't know about this. It's a pretty slippery slope than a, of where that leads in other areas of discussion, in other areas of conduct, in other areas of meaning and purpose. And you can believe this, and that's fine. It's not a salvation issue. But I will say this, it does become more challenging when you start asking questions of origin and meaning and morality and destiny. What does scientism lead to? Well, it's based on, on natural law, which states that anything that you, you can only believe what you observe. And if it's natural law, automatically anything supernatural is gone. It can't exist according to natural law. It's one of the challenges that we, we face with scientism. You know? That tr- it speaks that truth can only be scientifically proven, um, which in itself might lack some being scientifically proven. But it is, this is, it's where it leads to. There's this number. Uh, I can't pronounce it, and I won't attempt to. Any mathletes? Anyone a math person? Yeah? All right, so this number probably means something to you, or might even get close to meaning something to you. To me, I'm not a mathlete, and that is, that doesn't mean anything to me. And so explained out, uh, Sir Robert Penrose, the Oxford mathematical physicist and Wolf Prize winner in physics, 
uh, says this. He says, this number is the probability of precision needed for a complex life. And the way he describes this number is that if all the matter in the world was paper, it wouldn't be enough to write all the zeros of this number. And I'll take his word for that because I can't even begin to prove mathematical uh, physics type stuff. That is, my brain does not necessarily work in that way. Uh, but that's amazing. See, one of the, the problems with scientism and the challenges with it is that it hinges a lot on probability. It hinges a lot on probability. It's, if you flip the coin enough, eventually you'll get the result that you're seeking. At the same time, it doesn't really ask the question about why is the coin flipping in the first place? Anybody seen this photo? This is DNA. So a few years ago, uh, a, a researcher and, and his team in Italy took this picture with a, uh, with a microscope. And the DNA is actually that little white line. That's not an aberration on the screen. That's actually the DNA. It's not the cone structures here. Uh, and it's the first actual image uh, of DNA. And as I got into this, that was one of the things I started looking at. So what about the guys who map DNA to begin with? What about Crick and Watson? And so I started researching that. And Watson, uh, is, he's not a Christian. And he, he was asked in an interview um, in the early 2000s about, hey, can religion and, and science mix? How does this even, can they reconcile? Is there any way that you can know the science and believe in this? And he says, no. Uh, nobody I respect or know believes this. Except one guy. He's, and the way he described him, he said, I, we just have different brains. I don't get it. And that's his, his explanation of it. When it comes down to, we just have different brains. And that man is, um, is Francis Collins. Uh, Watson was, he was the director of the Human Genome Project. Francis Collins is the one who followed him. And in 2009, he became the, national, the, direct, the, the director of the National Health Institute. A very accomplished man and an atheist in his own right um, early on. And this is what he came to one day when he was do doing his residency uh, in med medical school. He said, I had made a decision to reject any faith view of the world without ever really knowing what it was that I had rejected. And that worried me. As a scientist, you're not supposed to make decisions without the data. And it was pretty clear I hadn't done any data collecting here about what these faiths stood for. And he was basically saying, as a scientist, I can't make an assumption about something I don't know the data for. And Francis Collins is one of these really interesting individuals because he's not one that cheap science, you know, for the belief in faith. In fact, you know, he, he even talks more about, he's like, you know, a lot of people say that when a flower blooms, that's a miracle, you know, when it sprouts. And he says, no, that's not a miracle. We know how that happens. You know, there's, there's a science to that. There, there's an understanding, an explanation to that, why that flower comes from a seed. That all makes sense. That's known. He said, but why is there a seed? He said, now that's a miracle. And so he's really, he's really precise with, with what he says and doesn't say. Um, and it's really, he's a really interesting guy to listen to with this. And, and just so you know, if you, if you research him and you look at his story, he'll talk about when he came to faith, he came to know Jesus. It was not a quick process. He talks that there was a day when he was out in nature and he knew. And then he talks about that there was about a year that that moment after that just wrecked his life. <laughs> and coming to terms with that. Um, and I think that's such an important thing to remember in our discussions with this. Because what's the main point again? It's that everybody lives somewhere forever. And we're about the work of the kingdom. We're not about winning an argument. We're not about necessarily just proving somebody wrong. We're about people. We love people because God loves people. And so we have to be gracious to people as we walk alongside them and as we discuss with them. 
Here's what it leads to ultimately. It leads to a detailed response for origin and destiny that's ultimately dependent on faith and probability. Yet it struggles to explain meaning and morality. This is where scientism leads to. But what does Christianity say to this? Well, things that we know from science is we know that um, the universe has a beginning. We know that it is knowable. We know that it's regular and that it's tuned, finely tuned for life. So when we talk about beginning, when we talk about beginning, you're basically left with three crazy choices to believe in. There's three crazy choices. Either God created it, either it happened, with no, it happened from nothing with no explanation, or it's always existed. And you have to choose one of them. And they all take faith. Okay, so when we start looking at evidence and everything, you're either, there's faith in probability, there's faith in a creator, in a God, there's faith in, it's just always been that way. There is no beginning or end here. It's just always been. It's knowable. Einstein said this, the most incomprehensible thing in the universe is that it's comprehensible. That we're part of this, the craziest thing is that we can actually understand it. That it's knowable. It's regular in Job 38. In fact, what Dan read is like 11 verses of chapters of this, the, mostly a monologue by God. Um, and I love the NIV version of it because it says, it's the one I first read it on. It said, you know, he, he responds to Job and God says, you know, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you'll answer me. You know, just this, I mean, it's just vivid. And it's just this moment of like, oh, well, I don't know how, you know, who does tell the sea where it ends and doesn't go further and, and all of this? Um, but it's regular. Consider this. Consider everything that needs to go right for this sermon to actually end. Right? <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> it's finally tuned for life. Okay. Um, there's this theory of multiverses that's been developed to extend the potential probability theory that seeks to explain how life could be so finely tuned. Now, I shared you the, the big mathlete number earlier, and then uh, this, there's this concept of multiverses of saying, well, maybe the probability doesn't exist in our universe, but if there's other universes and we're part of a big multiverse, that could extend the probability or the, the opportunity this could actually happen. Um, and there's a man uh, who, who's famed by, by the name of John Polkinghorne. Um, in fact, even, even Dawkins acclaims, acclaims him and says, hey, this guy's he's, le- he's a legitimate scientist. And, uh, and he's, a, uh, he's a scientist tur- turned, um, turned pastor or, and in England. And, and he, he talks about the, the theory of multiverses um, and he's another one of these guys that's very careful with what he says. You know, he's, he's got that scientific mindset. Um, and he says, you know, at best it's a metaphysical guess is how he describes the idea of a multiverse. That it's, it's just a theory. It's not proven, but it does extend the opportunity for probability. But this is why prepositions matter because once you conclude that there's no truth beyond what science can prove you do have to go to some pretty extensive links and so science is a great tool but it's it doesn't answer all the questions well of life in fact the strength of christianity is this the strength of the christian worldview is that it's daring and audacious enough to provide answers to the questions of origin meaning morality and destiny with coherence that's the strength of the christian worldview in this and that's why it matters so how do you have a constructive conversation right how do you have a constructive conversation about this with others
Ja. <laughs> yeah. How do we do with this? We, we've actually tried this here with our own drive-by baptisms. <laughs> one, of our, one of our staff members is... <laughs> So how do, you have a, how do you have an actual constructive conversation here with this? First thing is this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are as a son and daughter of the king. And here's what also that means is that our worldview actually assumes great dignity for humanity and creation. Our worldview assumes great dignity for humanity and creation. And so being argumentative, honestly, when we start getting that way, that's about us. That's not about truth. That's not about God. That's not about caring for other people. Remember who you are. Be informed. Know what, you know, it's important to know what you're talking about. Learn as much as you can about other worldviews. It's not enough to just, be, to just say, well, uh, it's not important to know what anyone else thinks or believes other than what I believe. You can't have a constructive conversation with that. Listen for understanding rather than debate. It's so critical to listen for understanding rather than debate. And this is really difficult in our culture because this is not something we traditionally value currently. Um, often we listen so that we can attack. And I don't know if, if you've had a conversation with like a five-year-old lately. You know, I have, and I can, st- I can sense this at times of like, okay, I got to figure out the hole in this here because we know this isn't okay. But listen for understanding rather than debate. And then lastly, ask questions about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. It's so critical that we ask bigger questions because one of the things that scientism assumes and it gets to is it says, it really has this pre- additional presupposition that um, philosophy doesn't matter. That because we have science, we don't need philosophy. Science can answer everything. We don't need anything that's philosophical in nature. Yet it really struggles to answer the question of meaning and morality. And so when you're in discussions, it's okay to just ask people, well, hey, where does this lead to? What, how do I know what's, what's good and bad? How do... How do you know where you come from? What does this mean about where you're going? And these are all questions. And listen to their responses. And so I want to pray for you as we, as we leave today and, and, and get into this a little more. So Father, we pray that you would um, help us to walk humbly. And to, to, to remember who we are. We're your sons and daughters. Remember our identity and where it's found. It's found in you. It's found in a cross and a resurrection. And it's not found in all the, all the other th- stuff of our life. God, remind us to, as we converse with others, as we engage with others, to, um, to speak with gentleness and respect. Remind us that our worldview that, the, that we subscribe to as Christians that it gives dignity and, and honor to others. God, remind us of that. God, and give us words to speak. Remind us that we're not the one that changed lives, that it's you. That you're the king of all. You rule over all and you can do all. God, continue to lead us in this way. Amen.